Our next speaker is Alexandra Detkovska. Um, and Alex is a postdoc in Edo Meats Lab at the Weizmann, where she uses single cell genomic technologies to decipher immune pathways in chronic diseases that are not necessarily considered to be immune diseases, like non alcoholic fatty liver disease and Alzheimer's. And her independent lab um, will be focusing on immune mechanisms of brain aging and neurodegeneration and is opening at the Pasteur Institute in Paris next month. Congratulations. Um, and the title of her talk today is Dissecting Immune Mechanisms of Chronic Disease with Single Cell Genomic Technologies. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining for this talk and thank you for inviting me to speak. It's, uh, it's really, really fun as for now. Um, in the Amit Lab, what we do, we use single cell genomics to approach diverse questions in immunology. Today I will show you three twists to single cell RNA uh, sequencing, which can really push our understanding of immunology tracking immune landscapes over time, illuminating cell-cell communication, and finally, in the last few minutes, I will show you um, some preliminary data on how we uncover genotype-phenotype relationships at single-cell resolution using our CRISPR screening technology called CRISPSEC. So first project I would like to talk about investigated a very common liver disease, NASH. NASH starts innocently with a condition called NAFOLD. The hallmark of NAFOLD is presence of enlarged lipid droplets in hepatocytes. And the reason is excess fat content in the body. Uh, consequently, NAFOLD is very prevalent uh, as it accompanies obesity, but by itself, it's not dangerous. Yet it gives a foundation for NASH to occur. Around 30% of people with NAFOLD will develop non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH, marked by necrotic hepatocytes, uh, fibrosis and inflammation. And from there, patients tend to progress to uh, either cirrhosis, where um, liver becomes one big scar tissue, becomes completely dysfunctional. And at the moment, the only treatment to this is liver transplantation. Uh, patients also often develop hepatocellular carcinoma, um, cancer with very limited treatment options at the moment. Um, now, inflammation and immune cell types and signaling seem to play a central role in transition from NAFOLD to NASH, from this very mild condition to a dangerous disease. And various cell types and pathways have been shown to contribute. Yet most of the studies investigated one cell type or one process at a time. And we thought that with single cell genomics, we can capture a picture of what's happening to these different cell types at the same time and draw arrows between them understand how they communicate, and possibly maybe pinpoint one cell type to rule them all. So we started with isolating immune cells from livers of mice that we put on NASH-inducing diet called methionine and coin deficient diet. Um, and we took the cells at different time points to get an idea of how the disease progresses. We identified a variety of cell types changing and uh, uh, one interesting thing that we noticed was the prominent increase in uh, dendritic cells uh, very early in the disease, in fact. And dendritic cells in tissues come in two major flavors, CDC1 and CDC2, with their distinct origins and markers. The notion of how they work is this. CDC1 and CDC2 um, take up antigens and kind of capture the picture of what's happening in the in immune environment in the tissue and then they change their phenotype into migratory dendritic cells and travel to the lymph nodes to show this information to the T cells. So first in our data, we looked uh, through different uh, models of NASH and NAFOLD at CDC1 and 2. And interestingly, what we found was that CDC2 are up in the livers in the animals in, bo in both NAFOLD and NASH models, but CDC1 are only strongly correlated with NASH. We also looked at uh, human samples. So recent microarray studies suggested that CDC may be also enriched in human livers. And we found that specifically CDC1 was increased in the blood of human uh, patients with NAFOLD and NASH. Since our human blood analysis and NASH and NAFOLD analysis in most models pointed to CDC1 um, involvement in NASH, we set off to test the function of CDC1 in NASH, and we based our studies on the manipulation of XCR1 specific marker, um, CDC1 specific marker called XCR1, and here you can see how specific it is across all the cell types that we found in the liver. 
we started uh, our functional studies from blocking XCR1 dependent C CDC1 infiltration to organs in mice that already had NASH for six months on this slow model of choline deficient high fat diet. So we blocked the CDC1 infiltration in these mice, but it was not very efficient. We only managed to block around 30% um, of the amount of CDC1s in the tissue. Uh, but it still did something. So when we look at the um, alanine aminotransferase level, which is a measure of how bad the liver is feeling, you can see that after a treatment, we saw a drop uh, in mice treated with the uh, CDC1 blocker versus we didn't see any change over the same time in mice treated with control. We also saw that the numbers of CDC1 correlated with different measures of uh, liver pathology, including fibrosis. This is what's uh, causing most problems uh, in patients. Um, but because this model was not giving us a clear answer, we went for another model of XCR1 uh, DTA mice. So in this mice, all the cells that express XCR1, uh, CDC1 cells, will also express diphtheria toxin. And this, this way we can get rid of uh, CDC1s uh, at all, 100%. And these mice, when we put them on a NASH-inducing diet, what we observe is that the disease is strongly attenuated. So this is a normal difference. Uh, in white, you can see normal difference between uh, how the disease progresses from normal diet to NASH-inducing diet. And you can see that these differences are strongly attenuated in mice lacking CDC1 in terms of um, liver pathology, in terms of um, liver damage. Okay, so it looks like um, CDC1 really play a negative role in NASH. Now, what do they do? What is the mechanism? We started from having a closer look at the differences between the healthy and NASH-derived dendritic cells in mice, and we found uh, markers of APC function to be upregulated, and especially in CDC1 markers of maturation to be upregulated. So it looks like what's happening in NASH to dendritic cells is um, they do what they usually do, antigen presentation, just they do it with more intensity. We also saw similar changes in uh, human dendritic cells. We saw more um, from the NASH patients. We saw, for example, a regulation of LAM3, which is thought to be a um, human marker of migratory or activated mature dendritic cells. So again, these cells capture antigens and a snapshot of immune environment in the tissue and travel to the lymph nodes to show this information to the T cells. And this is very interesting in NASH because um, we know that T cells have a function there. Um, CD8 T cells are important disease drivers in NASH and in our um, also recent collaborative effort with uh, Professor Matthias Heikenwalder from the KFZ, we uh, found that blocking CD8 attenuates NASH in mouse models. We also saw in our data, even though experiments were DC-oriented, that uh, CD8 cells react. So for example, here we see that in XCR1 um, DTA mice, um, even though they are put on NASH diet, nothing is happening in terms of CD8 activation. And in the other model, in the uh, long-term model where we block CDC1 infiltration, we saw that um, CDC1, CD8, and different measures of liver pathology co correlate together. So how do we study this? Here we decided to use another single cell based tool called PIXEC to have a closer look at how dendritic cells and T cells interact, specifically in NASH. Uh, PIXEC is a tool, uh, PIXEC stands for physically interacting cells, and the idea is that we take a tissue, in this case, liver lymph node, we dissociate it very, very gently, and we isolate and single cell sequence, single dendritic cells, single T cells, and the physical pairs of both of them isolated from the tissue. Then what we can do with it is uh, go through all the possible cell types of dendritic cells and T cells, and try to match them and see what's the, uh, what are the, what genes they express. And then we can compare these computed pairs to observed pairs, um, which gives us an idea of what are the interaction induced genes. And they are there, there's many, and they differ 
in our case, between normal diet and NASH condition. So for example, in NASH, you can see some interaction uh, dependent genes are NPG7, uh, IL-12 beta, Li6C2 genes related to immune activation. And these cells are not upregulated in the interacting cells in normal diet condition. So in conclusion, what we found in this study is that dendritic cells are upregulated in the liver in NASH. I didn't show the part uh, where we investigated of why they are upregulated. In fact, in fact, they cycle more in the bone marrow as progenitors. Then they go to the liver and, and from there they travel to the lymph nodes where they promote um, activation of more aggressive type of CD8, which then go back to the liver and promote liver pathology. Now, for the last few minutes, I want to switch gears and share with you some initial results from our second project dealing with Alzheimer disease. Alzheimer disease is the most prevalent form of aging associated dementia. Its major hallmark is the position of aggregated amyloid beta, which leads to functional loss of memory, neurons, and finally loss of function. Um, Alzheimer has also an immunological component. Recent research in our lab uh, identified a new subset of microglia. Um, these cells were present only in Alzheimer's condition, but not in uh, normal, healthy brains. And because they were so unique, we, found, we called them disease-associated microglia, or DAM. These cells express a specific subset of genes related to phagocytosis and lipid metabolism. And when we looked for them in the brains, in mouse models of Alzheimer, but also in human brains, we found them specifically associated with plaques. So it looks like they really sit in the heart of the disease. We also found that these cells specifically express or upregulate genes identified as AD risk modifiers, suggesting that the function of these genes and their effects on AD can be manifested uh, in our recently discovered DAM cells. So our goal here now is to understand DAM function. How are these cells induced? What modulates their activity? In long term, we want to find molecular targets for DAM function modification as a way to help patients with Alzheimer. Normally, in order to achieve this goal, we would need a knockout mouse uh, for all our suspected targets cross to Alzheimer mouse. And uh, if you ever tried this kind of breeding, you know it will take around 18 months to get the mouse that we want. So we wanted to try something more efficient. We decided to go for another single cell RNA seq derivative, a combination of CRISPR screen with single cell RNA readout. So we are using here the CRISPSEC platform, which we developed in the lamp before. Uh, we use a lentiviral backbone that contains a guide RNA for different targets, a color, um, a gene encoding for fluorescent protein, so we can trace which cells got to express this plasmid and so-called UGs, unique guide identifiers, which we can then sequence. We pack these plasmids in lentils, inject them to the brain, and sort the cells that got colorful. And then with our uh, homemade single cell approach, we can uh, MARSIC, we can look at their phenotypes and we can match them with their genotypes by tracing UGs in UGSEC. So here's one example of uh, how it works, very preliminary data set. Uh, we only targeted one target, ITGAM, a gene encoding C11B, very highly expressed um, marker of microglia. And we had non-targeting CRISPR uh, guide in the uh, mTOR encoding plasmid. We put them together in lentils, inject the brain of Cas9 mouse, sort uh, blue cells and cherry cells with index so we can trace them by the color instead of by the UG. And we go on with MarSec pipeline to see at single cell what happened. So first good news was that most of the cells that we fish out this way are microglia. We can only see this little cyan dot is a contamination. And at the protein level uh, in CD11B staining, we saw that all the cells that are uh, blue indeed express lower CD11B levels. So we hope that with such approach, we can then uh, go for targeting our uh, interesting targets, possibly contributing to the DAM phenotype and hopefully find DAM regulators. And with this, I would like to thank uh, Ido Amit, my boss, um, for recommending me to speak in this uh, beautiful symposium. 
I would like to thank uh, also people who did the work. Uh, Shir is uh, championing the CRISPR Alzheimer project and Ayal and Asaf that uh, are working on the computational side of both stories. And the rest of the crew, we have amazing collaborators, Matthias Eckenwalder from the KFZ in Germany, uh, Arzif from Shiba, um, Inserm. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity for an announcement. Uh, as it was mentioned, I'm honored to soon join immunology department of Institute Pasteur. Uh, my lab will deal, will use such single cell technologies for uh, deciphering the channels of brain immune communication. So if you liked what you saw today, uh, you are interested in brain immune, immune connection and uh, you want to live in Paris, uh, I'm looking for motivated people to join. Thank you very much for your attention once again. Thank you, Alex, great talk. Um, so if anyone has uh, questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Otherwise, I'm going to ask a question uh, to start with. Um, so do you have any evidence that, uh, so as these, you know, dams accumulate within Alzheimer's patients, do you think that it would be something that would eventually be reversible? Has there been any system you've been able to sort of turn a dam back into a normal microglial cell? Uh, I'm not sure if it's reversible or it's just um, lack of certain gene expression doesn't let them to develop or kills them. And this is the case with TREM2. TREM2 knockout mouse shown, was shown to have no dam. And, and we thought first that they don't develop because if you do your pseudo time, it looks like the transition stops. But then what we now know about TREM2 effects on uh, metabolism of me microglia, it's they're probably more prone to die under stress conditions. So they just uh, give up. Okay. Um, I'm gonna jump in too and ask a question. Um, mm -hmm. Amazing talk with so many different components. There's, I have a few questions, but I'll, I'll focus on one technical question. Um, this, I forget what you call it, PIC-seq for physically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about how broadly applicable this currently is? What, what types of cell-cell interactions are you able to detect with this? Yes. So, uh, of course, the dissociation of the tissue is key. We know that the T-cell dendritic cell interaction is very strong. These cells stay together for eight hours. So this is um, pretty well established in the protocol that we have works throughout the lymph nodes of all possible kind. Um, I know it has been done for um, lung epithelium, um, macrophage crosstalk, I believe, uh, but in development. So in development, everything is more mushy and it's easier to, to dissociate. So for, for really for each, uh, for each question, this dissociation will be very, very critical. And we develop these as we go with our questions. Okay, I think maybe in the interest of time, we should move on. Uh, so thank you very much, Alex.